really close to the beach, uh, which is beautiful. But um, uh, to recognise the quality of the people that you work with is, uh, is, is fantastic. It's got to take some time, as Tom said, to build the brand, but, but um, they're doing an amazing job. Right. Can you hear me, mate? Yeah, I can now. You know, it seemed like you broke up just a, a bit there, but um, but I can hear you now quite well. I'm making sign. Got, um, so right off the map to cover off the uh, the investment side of the of the lick strategy, but more broadly about WC in general. Um, I'm sure when you go to Invested A's, and I'm sure you've been to a lot of the, the Switzer A's and, and sitting in front of fund managers, everyone talks about their investment process or the philosophy of buying really high quality companies, a wide economic moat, buying them at a discount or intrinsic value. Everyone heard that. Anyone? Yeah, everyone? Okay. I'm here to tell you that WCM actually do something different and everyone says they do things differently. Um, but Ryan, can you maybe let us know uh, where you differentiate yourselves from other managers in the market and how you look at uh, uh, moats and culture as well? Absolutely. Uh, and, and thank you for doing all, all that hard work and heavy lifting on your end. So all we do is uh, simply manage the portfolio. It, it sounds like our job's a little bit easier compared to yours, uh, given this certain situation. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, we, we're very openly, we very openly admit here at WCM that we do things uh, that many other managers do, that, that we care about things that many other managers care about as well. Um, but we figured out a few core competencies that we think that we really, uh, we really hold close and, and, and we uh, we focus on in order to d develop um, a set a return stream um, that is unique in the marketplace. Certainly, we want to be be our benchmark and. And frankly, we want to win the investment game uh, as it as it as it uh, as it plays out relative to our peers. Um, so you hit on the, on the first piece and, and kind of the core of, of the strategy is is a, a differentiating differentiated take on uh, Warren Buffett's view of economic moats. He made it very popular to talk about large brands that were protected by very wide moats that uh, that uh, that allowed their businesses to to sustain growth over a very long period of time. Um, and we we appreciate that point of view, but what we've really come to um, latch on to and really built our, our firm around is uh, caring less about the fact that a moat exists and more about the, the fact that a moat has a positive trajectory. And what that means is that the moat can be skinny, it can be wide, that's that's fine. But what we want to see that over time, that business is is growing its return on invested capital. We want to see that the dollars that come into the business that reinvested help that business grow. Um, we want to see sales uh, in, in all the different channels uh, growing on a quarter over quarter basis. So by doing that, uh, you're able to not only take market share, but if you're continuously growing, then you're, then you're gaining pace and you're gaining speed and you're gaining distance on your competitors. Um, there are countless examples in history uh, of great businesses uh, that, that sort of had a stagnant moat that began to get eaten away uh, by competitors. Um, one of our favorite examples, um, not because we don't like the company, um, but just because it, it really illustrates in a very clear way how we view investing is, is uh, in, in the handset market. Uh, in 2007, there was a certain handset maker uh, that had 50% market share and was trading at 14 times forward earnings. Uh, that was, uh, as the Aussies call it, Nokia. Um, in my uh, New Jersey parlance, I'd say Nokia. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, Nokia was a 50% market share holder in 2007, uh, a great company dominating its business in a very exciting area at the time. Um, uh, in, in 2007, uh, a, couple little, a couple little things came to market. Uh, the Google phone uh, was, uh, was introduced into the, into the marketplace, and then the iPhone came into the marketplace. And so fast forward two years, Nokia's market share has fallen to 35% but it's trading 11 times earnings. So it's still a great company and it's cheaper. So let's buy more. Two things have happened there. Number one, the, the business has begun eroding its, its quote unquote large economic moat. Uh, number two, it's become a value trap for growth managers. So we don't wanna fall in either one of those traps. And so what we, what, we tend to, what we tend to look for for our buy signals are those growing re return on invested capital. And frankly, our, our sell signal is going to be when that return on invested capital Flat, uh, flattens out or, or becomes actually going negative. Um, that's, that's been one of the, the hallmarks of, of our success. Uh, we, we manage concentrated portfolios that, that, that uh, really there's very high competition for capital to get into the portfolio. So if you cannot make the case that the moat trajectory is positive and it's growing, it has a runway of growth in front of it, 
uh, then it's not going to make it in the portfolio and it's not going to, uh, is, or it will not stay in the portfolio if, if, it's, if it's held. The second piece uh, of business that, that we, we focus on uh, that we think really differentiates ourselves and, and I think that we've really created some distance between our peers uh, is uh, focusing on corporate culture. Um, when our management team took over uh, WCM in, in the late 90s, um, we determined that the key to uh, growing our business uh, would be to build, sustain, and nurture a corporate culture uh, that was designed to attract and retain uh, the great people, number one, uh, that have great investment talent. Um, and by doing that, we've, turned, we've, we've built a, a very strong business uh, on two core values. Uh, the first core value is gratitude. Uh, we've, we recognize we're very fortunate to be in the business that we're in uh, and the opportunity that we have. Um, we um, operate with the principles of candor, continuous learning, uh, audacious thinking, and, and, and frankly, uh, competition among, among talent. We really want to push each other to be better. We want to challenge each other. Um, secondly, our, our second core value is fun. And uh, that might surprise a few people, but uh, as we mentioned at the top, we are different than most money managers. Uh, the fun piece of it is really uh, recognizing the fact that we're, we're, we're lucky to be in the business that we're in and working amongst the people that we work with. And we, we really um, don't take our, ourselves too seriously. Um, and it really points to us enjoying what we do on a daily basis with the people that we're doing it. Um, so we're encouraging our team and we're constantly celebrating victories. And, and when we make mistakes, which we do, uh, we, we, con we, we tend to lock arms together and figure out a way uh, to, to solve that issue or, or, to, or to rectify a, a, a mistake. Um, so given that that has provided such, uh, such a strong uh, return to, uh, to our own firm over time, uh, we've turned that lens onto our companies. And so we've taken the culture piece and said, okay, how are we gonna figure out if a culture is good or bad? Um, there, there are no numbers in, in the financial statements that come out uh, to really highlight culture. Um, so what we've done <clears throat> is we've, we've boiled it down to a, a few key, key aspects. Number one, we wanted to see that the culture is aligned with the business. So that's us having the understanding that we don't have to exactly tell a business what sort of culture they have to have. We just have to feel like we understand their culture and that it's aligned exactly well with the type of business that they have. Um, the, a culture in, in a company like Shopify, which is a, a direct to consumer internet uh, uh, marketplace business, is going to be very different than something like a Canadian National Railroad, which is, which is very much focused on very different outcomes and very different uh, uh, qualities. We can get into that in, in a little bit. Um, but as long as those cultures in each of those in instances align with those businesses, then we believe that that is a culture that, that is appropriate for that business. The second piece of, of, the, of the culture work is, is the culture adaptable? In the Nokia exam example, that, cu that culture was not adaptable. They did not appropriately um, recognize the threat that was coming from the handset market, the, the smartphone market. Um, they, they felt they, they sort of turned a blind eye to that. Uh, and, and frankly, um, uh, it, it wasn't able to uh, pivot in a way to, to stay relevant. Um, that, that, uh, as we know, Nokia no, no longer makes handsets. Uh, in fact, they were sold to Microsoft and then, and then sold one, one more time, but, but they're not competing in the marketplace anymore. Um, so that, that, that company was not adaptable to the, to the changing uh, uh, areas of the market. And that's why um, the adaptability of a business uh, really incorporates being internally aware of what's going on with your with your workers, with your with your divisions, with with everything that's happening inside the, the walls of your company, but also externally aware. And in the Nokia example, that would be the Apple and, and Google phone uh, entrance. Um, so, again, aligned, adaptable. And the third piece is is the is the culture strong. And this is where we're really developing a a, a, a really steep and deep level of um, institutional knowledge. Um, We've developed uh, with, with uh, uh, some um, former Harvard PhD uh, professors uh, a 10-question uh, uh, list that we work off of uh, when we interview the C-suite of management teams uh, of businesses that we're, what we're, we are either invested in or considered investing in, as well as ex-employees. And so when we take those questions uh, and we interview a, a broad range of individuals, if we get answers from those same questions that they don't have to exactly uh, be word for word the same. They don't have to be, we certainly don't want them to be uh, uh, memorized from, from whatever uh, creed is on the wall inside the offices. We want those answers to rhyme because if they rhyme or if they, if they touch on the same, if they touch on the same topics, then we'll, we'll, we'll know that all those individuals, whether they're sitting in, in the C-suite currently 
or they're off in other businesses or, or, or they had an experience in the past with that company, then we'll know that that, comp that, 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 that culture was well understood by, by most everyone in, in the business and that allows the, the culture to be strong. So again, it's, it's, the culture has to be aligned, it has to be adaptable and it has to be strong. Thanks, Ryan. I'm, I feel a bit bit off here. It actually feels like you're in the room because the curtains here match the curtain. <laughs> Is that great? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Could have pulled that. Totally across. planned. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Ryan, we had uh, so just a, a, I guess an example when we talk about economic moat, you talk about the competitive advantage of the business and how strong or uh, weak that is. Um, in February this year, you guys sold Amazon after holding it for for nine or ten years. Um, can you give us a, a kind of some of the reasons behind the sale of Amazon from that mo from that competitive advantage angle, and potentially then maybe a Shopify where you've gone to uh, recently to show that you know I guess to highlight the reasons why you're in or out of a particular company with live examples. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, when I when I noticed your curtains, I wasn't going to say anything, but the, but I was going to do a joke that maybe I'd open the curtain and come out from behind there. Um, so so you're correct. We did sell Amazon uh, this year. Uh, great company. We had an excellent run with the business. Uh, as you mentioned, we owned it for over nine years, um, and in that nine year period, the business was really an amazing case study. Um, frankly, uh, when it start, when Amazon started, it was it was very widely known that it had a poor culture or or it was a tough culture, right? But at the time, when it was going through a hyper growth phase, that tough culture was necessary. Then they pivoted, they got a chief culture officer and they really focused on that and what, what it meant to build the brand and build the business beyond that. Um, so it was, it was internally aware that it needed to uh, adapt. So, so really cool things that lined up exactly with the way we invest. Um, Amazon Web, Web Services was, was a, a, you know, a tremendous gift uh, to, to the business that, that um, it, it continued to evolve. Uh, and and cust the customer base exploded. Um, and so while all that was going on, it was a wonderful ride. Uh, they had a very long trajectory in front of them. They're, they they were expanding their mode at, at rates that you, you couldn't imagine. Uh, no one could really imagine anyone uh, competing with Amazon, let alone uh, taking away any of the wind from their sales. Um, now with that said, we've gotten to a point recently uh, where uh, the, the focus of the business and, and the, the uh, bets, if you will, on where, where the company uh, is, is making for future growth have become a little bit uh, tenuous in our view. And I, I alluded to the fact that we have a concentrated portfolio. It's typically about 30 to 40 names. Um, and so we don't have to own every, every stock in, in, um, in the growth se in sectors. Um, we certainly don't have to own all, all the growth stocks that everyone else owns. We, we, we prefer not to, frankly. Um, but uh, when we looked at uh, Amazon and said, okay, uh, their opportunity set that they've had in the past was Amazon Web Services. We feel like that's been somewhat priced in. We feel like that's very well understood by the market. Um, and re in recent uh, uh, moves, the business has really turned towards a couple different areas. Number one is grocery. They, they purchased a, a company called Whole Foods. Uh, and it's a, it's a large, uh, uh, big big box uh, grocery store chain here in in, in the states, and um, and grocery as a business is really challenged. It's 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 doesn't have very high barriers to entry. The margins aren't great, um, and so we, we that was kind of like okay, well what what else do we have in, in the book here? And um, uh, Jeff Bezos has has um, really lamented missing the China opportunity, um, and he's then now turned his scope towards India as an opportunity set and. And uh, you know, both China and India, India have incredible demographics in terms of a, a, middle, a rising middle class, um, a really great disposable income story, a really great uh, story of um, you know more focus on healthcare, more focus on better diets, more focus on um, uh, in interconnectivity, all, all these things that, that would that would touch Amazon. But China and, and India are very different places. Uh, the one party system versus it times a sloppy democracy uh, we just didn't feel like it was it was exciting enough uh, to, to really to really defend the, the, the company in in the portfolio uh, anymore now is Amazon a great business absolutely I mean you know it, it's going to be delivering to my house probably 15 or 20 times in the next few weeks um, but with that said do we feel like their moat their moat trajectory is wildly positive do we feel like they have a long runway in front of them uh, do we feel like there are other businesses that are that are growing their mode at, at, at a better rate uh, or, or doing more disrupting things? We sort of feel the latter is more true than, than the former, 
Um, and, and we feel like our capital is, is best served with those businesses that, that are doing a better job growing faster and, and that have a, a longer runway in front of it. Um, you, you mentioned Shopify. It's, it's one of our, our, our favorite holdings um, that we've had. We've held for about two years now. Um, and, and there are a couple of things about Shopify that really not only highlight how uh, WCM does business, but also um, things we like in businesses. Um, so Shopify, for anyone in the room who, who doesn't know what it is, it's a uh, it's a uh, basically um, a business that if you if you make and sell anything that you want to be able to go direct to your consumer and, and and maybe not use something like an Amazon via the web, they'll help you set up a web presence uh, in, in kind of an a la carte way. Um, just the web page, uh, web page plus uh, transactions plus billing plus accounting plus. Uh, Fulfillment. Uh, so, so, the, so there's a, a, a long list of, of, of things that Shopify can do for you uh, and can add on to your to your uh, service, but it's a flat fee. So you understand how much you're going to pay. Um, when it comes to Amazon, there are quite a few unknowns for uh, f for small businesses and medium sized businesses. Frankly, uh, Amazon keeps all of the all the information of all, of all the consumers that that uh, buy products through Amazon. Um, Amazon does not tell you how or where your 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 company will pop up in, in the in the initial search, um, and they charge anywhere between fifteen and thirty percent of every sale. So that's an expensive uh, price to pay for not much in return other than access to all of uh, Amazon's eyeballs, which admittedly are quite quite large. So Shopify is coming at it from a different point of view. They've made it very easy to get started, and and what they've done is. They've, they've, they've got a culture that is uh, laser focused on delighting uh, the merchant. So whether you sell pens and, and all you use it for is, is the website or you sell uh, or you're you know, Johnson & Johnson, you have a whole suite of products. Um, the, one, the, the Shopify team wants to make sure that each of those, each of those uh, vendors, merchants, are going to be delighted with, with the product, with, with their, their ability to reach their customers uh, for the price that they pay. Um, and so by, by doing that, Shopify has grown leaps and bounds. I mean, the, the company really began as um, a mom and pop solution, right? Because um, it, it allowed a, a kind of a very customized uh, solution for, for those small businesses. But as they grew, um, uh, they've really taken on very well-established and large businesses. Uh, I mentioned Johnson Johnson, Levi Strauss, uh, Gatorade. There, there are a number of others uh, that have come through Shopify. Um, and it, it's really because of that culture of delighting the merchants. Uh, the, the, I think in the last quarter, uh, they, they, they uh, eclipsed their, their millionth merchant. Um, they're doing over 40 billion a year in, in, uh, in sales through, through their uh, websites. Um, uh, we have a, a famous sale day here in the United States. The day after Thanksgiving is called Black Friday. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, the following Monday is, is Cyber Monday. So if you don't get trampled in stores on Friday and you want to shop from home on Monday, Cyber Monday is a very important sales day. Um, and Shopify merchants are, are, are clawing away and grabbing more and more of the sales that can happen uh, on that day. Um, the last thing I'll say is, is, is as it relates to a runway, um, they've proven the ability to delight small businesses. They've proven the ability to take large businesses who, who want uh, to be able to own their own direct-to-consumer uh, product. Um, and, and really what they haven't done is they have not uh, really expanded internationally yet. Uh, we, we believe their total addressable market is, is well larger than what they've actually been able to touch. Um, the international market is something they have not really been able to um, expand into just yet. Uh, but, but these are things that we, we foresee for them uh, going down the road and, and, and should be a, a, a real long-term uh, play. Uh, the company's rewarded us with uh, a share price that's, been, that's uh, gone up uh, a number of times, uh, well over 130% year to date. Uh, since owning it, um, in our buy and manage strategy, we've trimmed it three times and taken those dollars and, and re recycled them into our other high conviction holdings. Thank you, Ron. I should say thank you for saying Nokia too. I'm looking forward to hearing you say Adidas. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. <laughs> so, so a 38 stock portfolio at the moment of companies that have a growing competitive advantage and a good culture. Um, how, how do you go about achieving the downside protection that you do? So over, the, over the, the journey of the strategy since March 2008, there's been 71% downside capture. Can you explain what downside capture actually means? And I guess the holy grail for managers or managers of money 
taking money out on the downside but participating in more of the upside. Can you talk us through how that works with a 38 stock portfolio as a growth manager? Yeah, you know, one of the things we really like to do, especially with, with new investors, is talk them a little bit off the ledge because when you describe our strategy, it's going to feel like a volatile strategy. It might make you kind of sit back from the table a little bit. You know, we're a concentrated portfolio. We invest in global stocks, uh, in, in growth sectors like healthcare, uh, and information technology, uh, and, and, and people can, can immediately let their mind wander to, to areas of the market that are, are really very volatile. Um, and, and frankly, it's not the case with our portfolio, um, and there's a few reasons uh, why. Um, we found that the moat trajectory piece um, and the culture piece together really lead us towards very high quality businesses. And in most market cycles, um, where when you're on the growth side of it, or maybe the peak or the or the turn, um, the highest quality companies are really a, a, a bit of a a bit of a, a port in in in, in the storm. Uh, and, and really, high, the, the higher the quality of the business, the last it is to be sold, uh, and the higher quality of the business, the first it is to rebound coming out of a, a tough period. So just just by doing our fundamental work on on the businesses understanding that mode trajectory and then also being able to pair with it a great culture um, that's that's served as, as a great ballast to the portfolio uh, over time um, secondly uh, you know as I mentioned we don't have to own everything uh, across the benchmark so um, there will be times when we have headwinds but um, we don't own uh, energy stocks we don't own the large uh, the, the, the large bulge bracket banks um, we don't own real estate we don't on the utility so in certain markets when those are are, are really struggling or, or doing poorly um, we won't feel the, the effects of that headwind um, but if, if growth overall um, has headwinds as we saw sort of in um, uh, September of this year um, we see our portfolio uh, you know act in sympathy with the market so so it's not the case that we won't ever lose money but we hope we have hopes that through our, our stock selection and then through our portfolio construction, that we'll be, we'll, we'll be uh, losing less than the market at any given time. And if we have high enough quality businesses that are run by great management teams doing doing very smart business uh, decisions during that time frame, they'll come out of, of, of a negative period, uh, uh, you know, looking better than their competitors, uh, or, or if not stronger. Um, and so I mentioned the uh, the portfolio construction piece. It's a bit of a risk management um, uh, point of view. Um, we tend to d define or, or uh, d delineate stocks uh, in the growth world as either defensive growth, secular growth, or cyclical growth. So at any given time, half of our portfolio are in defensive growth names. These, these are picks and shovels businesses. These are businesses that um, have a, an offering to, to, the, to, the, to the consumer uh, that, is, um, that is very hard to give up. It's one that is uh, broadly broadly diversified. Um, it's it's one that is 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 the you know whatever the opposite of binary would be. Um, frankly, um, businesses that 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 you can almost uh, own for for uh, 10, 20, 30 years and, and, and never look at. So half the portfolio being in, in defensive names has served us well, especially in the past decade, uh, as as we've been uh, going through through uh, a little bit more volatility than we've seen in, in most recent years than we have over prior. Um, the remaining half of the portfolio is going to be split between uh, the cyclical growers, which are more tied to sort of GDP. They're the, they're the mid single digit uh, steady growers and the secular growth names like a, like a Shopify that, that really have the high octane. Uh, the secular growers are going to be the ones that really help us keep, keep pace with, uh, with those rising markets, that, that especially like the ones we've, we've, been, we've been in uh, uh, in recent years. Um, but the defensive growth names are the ones that we feel like will really carry the day. Uh, through sustained volatility, if not uh, uh, maybe a, a recession or, or some sort of global temp downturn. Right. Um, Ryan, as a growth manager, it's good you touched on portfolio uh, composition. What what are the sort of sectors that you that you overweight at the moment, and, and what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, the the sectors we're overweight are are uh, you know healthcare, information technology. Uh, we're overweight in materials, um, uh, and then and then the rest of the the exposures are really in in consumer. Uh, as well as uh, we do have some financials, uh, some specifics I can go into there if we care, but we're in consumer discretionary, we're in consumer staples. Um, and, and we feel like uh, our largest two sector overweights uh, being healthcare and uh, information technology, um, they really uh, not only have great 
uh, array of businesses that, that we can pick from that, that have very long-term growth potential, uh, but they have global tailwinds that are, that are very hard to slow and, and, and almost impossible uh, to reverse. Um, so in, in the healthcare space, um, there's a broadening reach of, of healthcare globally. Emerging market spend has gone up significantly. The quality of healthcare across the globe has gone up. Uh, and there are a lot of different businesses that are participating in, in that. Um, from a technology um, perspective, um, advances continue to happen um, in, in the technological space, whether it's from handsets and, and tablets and computers to smart homes to, uh, to other things that are running business and, and things that are helping us be more efficient uh, and more connected. Uh, and, and those things, are, that's not going to change. So, you know, once that Pandora's box has been open, um, that's going to be that's going to be a, a driving force going forward. So, so we like things that have a very um, a very strong uh, global tailwind uh, to them. And then we also uh, want to see that the business has a runway in front of it um, that it, that it can take advantage of and, and really grow through that period. So, mate, you can uh, you can actually play healthcare and tech a few different ways, as you mentioned, and you mentioned the picks and shovels type approach. Obviously, going back to the gold rush in uh, in the 1840s in the US, talk us through what the picks and shovels kind of um, thought is, and and how you're actually playing healthcare because it's not the it's not the wonder drug that's coming up. It's not the biotech company. It's, you're playing it in a quite a different way, which can which obviously contributes to that defensive nature of the portfolio. Absolutely, yeah. Within healthcare, um, uh, you know, drug approvals and patent cliffs are are really dangerous, uh, really dangerous uh, variables to play with, uh, and we we want really no part of it. In fact, uh, there's a company we own on, that's actually on the other side of it that that actually uh, really uh, benefits from how stringent the healthcare uh, process is uh, on a global nature. So, West Pharmaceuticals is a business we own in the portfolio. And um, they, uh, they're a Pennsylvania uh, company based here in the United States, uh, and they're the uh, global dominant supplier of packaging uh, with about a 70% market share uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, and so when I say packaging, you can think um, droppers, uh, you know, the, the little pinching droppers and, and, the, and, the, and the rubber stoppers in, in a syringe. So really integral parts to, to these, uh, d these delivery methods. Um, so when you develop, if you spend all this money and all this time and all this, uh, all this intellectual property on, on building a drug or, or creating a, 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 um, a treatment, uh, and then at what, what is required is that you also approve the delivery method. You also approve the packaging. So enter West Pharmaceuticals. So the business that goes and develops all the IP and takes all the risk will be over here. And once, they, once they're getting towards uh, approval, they contact West Pharmaceuticals and, they, and, they, and then they cross over and use West Pharmaceuticals, frankly, as an outsourced R&D partner. So that they're able to then bring their products to that drug maker or, or to that pharmaceutical company and then work with them on what the, what the most appropriate packaging for that, that product is. Now, the thing that we love about that is that if the drug producer chooses to change at all their delivery method, they, it restarts the approval process. So it's a headache that none of those companies really want, really want to go through. Uh, they want to do it once, they want to do it right, and they want to, and they want to partner with a, with a group for a very long time. And so West Pharmaceuticals being, being kind of the, the gold standard in the industry um, and the fact that uh, there's no shortage of work being done uh, in, in, the, in the healthcare space in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals and, 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 and in, 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 um, in, in the healthcare arena, uh, they're going to be the preferred partner. They're going to, they're going to be, uh, the, the best position in, in the marketplace to provide all those things that, that are kind of a, a, a very large decision on, on the business's end. But once that decision is made, it's a very sticky relationship. Um, and you can really, you can really, um, you can really, uh, you know, bet on that relationship. And, and we don't take the risk of, of, uh, of uh, the binary risks of drug approval and or uh, patent clips. And to have to go through the clinical trials again and the, and the, F, the Food and Drug Administration um, approvals is a long and costly process to save 20 or 30 cents on a pack, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Ryan, so we, we sit back over here a lot and laugh about what's going on politically over in the US. Um, <laughs> well, I do anyway. I don't know about anyone else. Um, it's quite laughable. We so. lose sleep. Say it again. I said we lose sleep. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So um, obviously, election coming up next year. 
Um, you, you guys don't really focus on the macro, uh, for, for want of a better term. So it doesn't concern you where interest rates are going. It doesn't concern you what, what's happening with the trade wars and kind of all those uh, things that a lot of the talking heads will get up on and, and, and make a call on. Um, if you've got to, if you've got to make some macro calls, make a lot because you might get one right. How do you focus on the macro? And this is where I'm going to give you a chance to talk about Adidas. <laughs> Never heard of it. Uh, yeah, so um, what, what, one of the focuses we have uh, in, in our portfolio, we're, look, we're committed to a global portfolio. We want to have um, exposures to a, a wide range of, of geographies, industries, currencies for that matter. Um, but when we, when we look at our businesses, um, we, so we certainly care where the headquarters are, but it's the next layer of the onion is almost more important to us uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, because it helps us focus on the fundamentals of the business rather than the noise that is created uh, by macroeconomic environments. Um, so the next layer of the onion that when you peel back, you, you, fo you focus on where the revenues come from. Uh, so, so that business will have a headquarters and that's all well and good, but, but where, is that, where, where is that company making sales? What are the communities, what are the, what are the uh, cultures that are purchasing this, 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 uh, this good? Um, because you know that's what really will project whether or not that business will be success, successful in the future. So Adidas is one of our favorite uh, companies to talk about internally because it's just so fun to say. But also um, because uh, in 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 the most recent um, sort of high profile global macro headline that's been being pitched around is really uh, the the U.S. China trade war uh, and sneakers, uh, as we all know, have, have historically been uh, widely produced in China and, and about 70% of the sneakers that, that get shipped to the United States really come from China. Um, so immediately um, Adidas would be, have a bullseye on it and you'd think that's, let's get out of that business. It's, gonna, it's going to have you know, a, a, an un, unanalyzable outcome and we don't know how this is going to look. Um, but when you take that, that layer of the onion back, you recognize that um, yes, uh, Adidas, Adidas, excuse me, uh, does uh, produce uh, shoes in China? In China, they've got production facilities there, and we like that because they're they're taking advantage of a of a middle class uh, that is consuming uh, athletic wear. They like they like visible brands. Um, there's an inc there's a rise of uh, of exercise uh, tr trend going on there. Um, but really, that Chinese those Chinese installations sell to China internally. Everything else that gets shipped globally happens in Southeast Asia. So on the on the first blush, you'd think, gosh, well, we're, we're square in the middle of a, of a global macro problem here. But, but by understanding the business and understanding our company and, and having management teams that, that recognize that, that there's value in having China dedicated production and, and then there's global production elsewhere, uh, that's something that, that we really rely on. Uh, and, and by understanding it uh, well, that we're able to you know, act at a level head. You know, is the company feeling some degree of, of, uh, of volatility around What's going on in the global marketplace? Certainly, um, but it's certainly not at, at the level of risk that others may be at, at the time. Um, and, so, and so, while we pay very close attention to to these um, these large uh, big picture um, forces, uh, we, we make sure we understand what will happen on the micro outcome with, with our underlying business. That's a fascinating outcome, and to, the fact that you use um, you don't use cash derivatives options or anything to manage the downside. Uh, means that you've really got to focus on uh, the companies and you know partner with these really great companies and let them do what they do. Yeah, you know we do target uh, less than five percent cash in the portfolio at all times. Uh, we we take on that responsibility uh, uh, on behalf of our investors, right? We, it, it's their job to figure out what to do with their cash when they when they entrust it to us. We we feel like we're charged with going and finding the best companies we can in the world. And frankly, we're excited about uh, the opportunity set that we're finding globally. Um, within the sectors we really like. Um, so yeah, the, the, the long-term uh, track record has really been built uh, by owning very high quality, great companies that have been able to grow their, their uh, economic moat. Can you uh, thank everyone in the team for, for that, but that kind of doesn't matter to us uh, because it's with other people's money. Can you, can you continue on doing that with ours? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 it's the um, it, it is the bit of the bane of meeting new investors because there, there's a bit of that um, fear of missing out or, or you know we don't want to be the last dollars in. Um, but you know we're invested alongside uh, all, all of our investors. We have 
our portfolio managers have revenue shares in their own business. So everyone is very much aligned in, in growing WCM and growing WCM means continuing to, to behave in the way we have uh, in, in the prior 10 years uh, going forward. Uh, there are 55 employees at the firm. There are 28 equity owners. Um, so it's a broadly owned business. Um, we're, we're, we're a true family. Um, and, and one of the things um, that we'd like to point out is, uh, is that, uh, you know, in, in the structure of the portfolio being concentrated, uh, we have very low turnover. The turnover of the portfolio is around 25% per year. And about half of it is adding and trimming to existing names. Uh, that comes back to some of, some of the, the, the downside capture. I mentioned that Shopify, uh, we trimmed a number of times since owning it. We've taken that capital and put it into other names that might be having small, short-term headwinds in front of it, uh, whether it's uh, an earnings report that, that, that Wall Street didn't appreciate or, uh, or, or there's just general market sentiment against uh, the overall sector. We'll take that capital and we'll, 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 we'll do what we think is right and put it into, into either a new name or existing names that might be facing uh, short-term headwinds. Um, and then, you know, secondly, what I'd say is that as it relates to that turnover, we don't have a team that is a bunch of uh, all-stars. We don't have, uh, you know, no, no one's names are written down next to the stocks that are in the portfolio. It's one portfolio, one team, we're global generalists. Uh, so really everyone's fortunes and everyone's uh, focus is tied on the, on the overall portfolio. In fact, when, when mistakes happen, um, actually prior to mistakes happening, I, I should probably back up and say, uh, when, we, when we're pitching a new idea or when we're analyzing a new idea, we write a pre-mortem. Uh, we go through all the work of understanding why we think this is a great business and then we get bullish on it and then we take that hat off and put our, put our we were wrong hat on and we do a pre-mortem on that business to understand, okay, what could possibly go wrong? What are the things that we're looking at here um, that could take the legs out from underneath us, that could, that could force us to lose money and lose our investors' money? And so by, by highlighting those things and really discussing them uh, collectively, um, we feel better prepared to make strong decisions when and if things like that occur. Um, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a thesis break. It might be thesis creep. It might be it might be the fact that um, that some, certain things could come to light, and we knew that it would come to light, and we're okay with it, and we're going to strive through it. Um, but but those are all pieces that have helped sort of the long term uh, return stream of this business, and going forward, it's it's going to be built on the same structure. Um, so while we, we obviously can't guarantee uh, future returns, uh, we hope we really have it cemented the process in place and the team in place uh, that can continue to can continue to provide the return characteristics at least uh, that we have uh, heretofore. Very good, man. Is it rude to ask Americans what they think of the election? Who do you think is gonna win or what's gonna happen? It depends if it's over if it's over dinner with the in-laws, that's a no-no. Uh, but if it's uh, if it's among friends, uh, you know, it, it's changing. Uh, I can tell you, it's it's uh, there are candidates that came out, uh, uh, you know, from on the on the, on the Democratic side that came out uh, on fire and really created quite a buzz, and they've fallen off completely and disappeared. So it, it's it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And I think the fireworks will be uh, tremendous. I it's it's not. I hope it goes well uh, in terms of a, a, a you know a, a respectful, uh, thoughtful process. Um, there's a chance it won't. Um, but talk with that. Yeah. But but we are we you know we are we're heads down in the portfolio. We're head down in, in our in our names. And um, regardless of the outcome, um, you know we, we feel like global economies uh, can't cannot be you know changed overnight. Um, and so so we're we're making bets on the work we've done. Uh, currently, and, and we feel we feel really great about a concentrate, concentrated portfolio of best ideas. Very diplomatic answer, mate. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, as much as I love my own voice, I'm gonna hand over to the floor now and ask for any questions of Ryan before we uh, finish up in a few minutes' time. Any, any questions of Ryan? Yes. Uh, Ryan, you touched on the, your spread of your 38 investments across the sectors. Can you comment on what the spread is across uh, geographic? Um, how many are American-based? What's your what's your uh, reach um, around the world? Yeah, so I have a data point here. Uh, as of the third quarter, uh, the portfolio in 38 companies um, spanned 10 sectors, 22 industries, 14 countries, and had exposure to 12 different currencies. Um, and as I mentioned, um, when we when we peel back the onion on on that 38 companies. Uh, about 12% of those companies are in emerging markets that they're domiciled. 
but really uh, 29% of the revenues of the portfolio come from emerging markets. Um, we hold a company called Nestle, uh, which is a widely known European um, uh, you know, consumer company, um, but half of their revenues come from emerging markets. And so even though it's a very widely recognizable brand that, that seems very well established and, and, and very, uh, very um, uh, you know, developed economy type business, it's really, it's really got its tentacles and, and its products out into the emerging market world. So, so we feel like we've got a diversified reach across geographies um, and, as well as currencies and industries. Following on from that, would you be overweight or underweight certain countries dramatically or, or is it at the margin? You know, we pay attention to that because uh, you know that's been something that is uh, that has been that has hurt other managers in the past. We try to do a lot of learnings on 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 other managers and other other strategies that have uh, experienced some success in the past and that have really uh, put themselves into harm's way by by being whether it's an ego thing or or it's just uh, being blind blindsided by by their positioning. Uh, we t we tend to to really be. Um, uh, pretty pretty well diversified without necessarily making a massive overweight. Um, with that said, I mean, we're going to go where the opportunity set takes us. Um, Mercado Libre is one of the businesses in, in the portfolio. Um, we, we added that company at a time when, when the research team was actually had it scheduled to go to China uh, and Asia for, for uh, a, a, t a general research trip, something they very frequently do. Um, and uh, South America was, was extremely volatile at the time. Brazil uh, was facing uh, implosion, it seemed like at the time. And so they canceled their tickets to China and they went to South America. They, they met with, I believe, 12 different companies. And uh, the, the story goes that uh, around 10 of the companies, were, the management teams were just kind of throwing their hands in the air, saying, oh, this is too hard. The economic environment's out of control. Our currency is falling, falling through the floor. Um, our, our government is a wreck. Um, and then others uh, like Mercado Libre uh, were saying, this is an environment we can take advantage of. This is, a, this is an environment where our business can grow. Um, and there was sort of a no complaining policy there. And so um, that, that was something that really stood out, um, uh, not only from a corporate culture side of things, but also from the strength of business. Um, and so, uh, so while we felt like it was, res it, was, it was important to go to China and Asia at that time, we felt like the opportunity set was pointing towards towards sort of that volatility and that and that uh, that tumultuousness that's going on in South America. Um, so that's kind of a, m more important to us. Uh, we'll pay attention to where our our geographic exposures are at all times, of course. Um, uh, and and but at the same time, uh, when names come in or out of the portfolio, it's really more a function of uh, of what's going on in those in those economies and what's going on with the stocks that that, that play there. Did you have? Yeah, John. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan, for the presentation. My my question relates to the cents per share currently in the dividend accumulation account. We'll, we'll cover that off separately okay. uh, as the company here. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan will focus on kind of the investment. So okay. he, he doesn't Fine. know about the leak here. Thank you. <coughs> yes. I do valuation alone ever lead to a decision to sell and does the view on where interest rates are going, how important is it to have a view on that to work out that valuation? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, look, valuation matters. Uh, we are growth investors and so we're, we're, you know, we're going to be buying things that look expensive at the time, but, but the way we win in the long run is by getting uh, invested in these businesses that are able to grow at a sustained level for longer periods of time, right? So if anyone's ever um, uh, done a discounted cash flow model uh, to try to figure out uh, what, the, what a stock price should be trading at, uh, they know that when you, when you peel, apart, peel apart the financials of a business in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, you know, cash flow statement, the income statement, the balance sheet, uh, and, and you try to project it forward based on past growth rates and, and some other assumptions, uh, you can only assume so far out until you have to start to fade those assumptions down to either something like cost of capital or GDP growth, um, which are fairly arbitrary, um, just to make your price target somewhat sensical, uh, you know, not, not an insanely high number. But what we do is we find businesses that, we've, that we uh, internally discuss uh, as defying the fade. So if you can find businesses that in that fourth, fifth, sixth year, those out years, 
continue to grow and, and expand uh, their return on invested capital, then you can justify the price that you're paying today because on a backward looking basis, it will be actually cheap. Um, so, so that's what we hope to do uh, in terms of uh, identifying our investments. Now, there are times when investments run uh, significantly and, and, and you know, as I mentioned, we do, man we do have a buy and manage um, mantra. So uh, when, a, when a business uh, like a Shopify or a Tencent uh, gives you a hundred plus percent return, uh, we're going to be looking at it very closely to see how much how much capital we want to leave in that debt at that time, and that will that will come down to what the runway looks like, um, as well as what their what their existing opportunity set is. Um, so if if in like for example a Shopify uh, that has run you know well over 100% year to date, uh, and we have trimmed it back, we've chosen to trim it um, specifically because of that total addressable trust, total addressable market. Uh, the, the fact that they, their take rate is, is around 1.5% versus you know, 15% from Amazon and, and others. Uh, so they have that ability to raise costs. They have that ability to ex expand globally. So we feel like if you fast forward a bunch of years, we'll look back and say this was actually a, a, a valuable, a, a real, I don't want to say cheap, but, but it looks like a, a fair price for the business. Um, with that said, we have sold businesses in the past uh, just because valuations got so significantly stretched. So um, Hermes is, a, is one that jumps off uh, to the top of my mind. Uh, we have a very healthy weight to the consumer, and that consumer weight is typically skewed towards luxury. Um, uh, those brands are typically iconic. Uh, they, they typically have a, a, a number of different business lines uh, that can, that can uh, carry the day at any given point, and, and, and in some cases, all the business lines are doing well. Uh, but in, in the case of Hermes, um, uh, it, it was one where it just gotten – so expensive that we were able to take those take those um, proceeds and, and roll them into other ideas that, that maybe had uh, a, a better value, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the right price for the right business and, and, and the runway that we were looking at. Up the back here, was there a... one more question on the back there? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh. So um, I think you mentioned something about like if a company has a negative uh, negative return on investment capital that you would probably sell for that. So currently, I think Shopify has negative earnings. So, what makes you think that Shopify is still good to hold your portfolio, even though it's making negative losses? Do you think that Shopify will make profits in the nearby future? Yeah, I, I, it's it's a com it's a combination of a number of things, and and you know we we were aware we're aware of of, of the current state uh, of, of of the of the you know balance sheet and. Um, frankly, uh, the, the opportunity set in front of the business is so broad and so long, um, and then and it's one of the one of our favorite cultures in the portfolio. Uh, they're they're just uh, relentless about uh, growing their business. They are um, you know laser focused on uh, innovating and, and 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 going and taking market share. Uh, and 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 really, um, in, in one of our favorite quotes is that. Uh, when, when interviewed, some of the merchants say Shopify knows what we want before we want it. Uh, and that's just the sign of, of a, a very rare business um, that, that will continue to add, uh, add value and, and grow over time. And you could probably could have said the exact same thing about Amazon you know, 10 or 12 years ago uh, in that uh, you know, the cash burn was incredible. Uh, there, there's no, no real visibility to profitability. Um, but we feel like Shopify is does have that uh, kind of Amazon-like opportunity set. I mean, um, in fact, today Amazon, sorry, Shopify looks similar to Amazon in its life cycle. And Amazon, and, and we've done a study that we see sort of Shopify trading cheaper right now than Amazon did at a similar period of its life cycle. Um, so we're hopeful that the, uh, the 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 breadth of the total addressable market, their ability to increase their take rate. Uh, relative to peers, I mean, it's, it's so low compared to their peers, um, and 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 the continuing focus on on really delighting the merchant will carry the day and continue this growth trajectory. It doesn't have to be a hockey stick for a, a you know a hockey stick for us for, for to get uh, super excited about the business or even stay there. Uh, we we think that the growth uh, trajectory of of Shopify uh, is strong uh, and and very long term in nature. I think it's worth noting that that that, that would sit in a secular growth type. Bucket within the portfolio construction, so it's not necessary that that we need to see in the next year or two the earnings take off and the and the growth and, and that. But with the growth trajectory behind it, and with the experience of kind of companies that they've had in the past, um, Ryan, I'm reminded of Nova Nordisk. Um, that, you know, you guys were 
lauded for paying 25 times for, for that business. And fast forward five years, you could have paid 100 times for it and still beaten the index. So it's looking, so it's actually looking at a different, through a different lens and seeing does this company have a significant growth trajectory behind it um, uh, rather than something stagnant trying to pull apart a DCF to get a valuation or a margin of safety on a share price. So they, they, it won't form a big part of the portfolio, but, it, but it's, it's one of those um, one of those companies that they can look at and say, use four, five, six, eight, ten, they want to be involved. How do I go there? <laughs> No good. Okay. <laughs> one last question. Sorry. Did you want me to expand on that? I mean, what, it, it, it also reminds me of of, uh, of like Baidu, right? I mean, at Baidu, we, we purchased at ninety five cents a share, which is effectively a hundred times uh, earnings when we bought it. Uh, fast forward five years, the company was earning four fifty, and then when you look back over that five year period, we actually paid two to three times. So, so history has a funny way of of making you look uh, like a you know like a bargain shopper as long as you bet on the right business. Uh, that grows in the right way. Ron, we might uh, pull up some. So, have you got some skiing to do in Vancouver, or what's the what's happening over there? Yeah. No, you know, I'm, I'm dodging. I'm dodging raindrops here. It's 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 quite stormy, which is, I guess is good for the mountains. Uh, I'd love to pop up to Whistler, but it's a short trip. It's uh, tonight, and I've got I've got some uh, business stuff to do in the morning tomorrow. It's a straight home to the team. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've we've uh, had this is number four of. Uh, for over the last uh, month or so, and, and um, you know, we, we obviously value your time incredibly, your openness and, and uh, the way you articulate the strategy, and, and um, mate, we thank you so much, and uh, love and best wishes to the family, mate. Safe trip home. Thank you very much, everyone. You know, I, I don't know why I'm not getting the invite to come down there for your summer, right? I mean, you know we like the beach here, so. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you're welcome any time. I've got so many meetings for you to come and do. Um, <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for everyone for coming. I hope you got a lot out of that. You can see, I think, why we're so um, genuinely excited about WCM um, and bringing a, a differentiated strategy to the market. Um, it, it's, you know, the one thing that stands out for me, the correlation of excess returns uh, versus the other um, other um, managers in the market here, the Magellans, Antipodes, the Platinums and all of those are, are completely uncorrelated. The portfolio doesn't have any FANG stocks in it apart from Netflix, which they're talking about at the moment. Um, so it's a completely different uh, strategy, completely different exposure that you can get bolted onto the side of an international, um, an international part of a portfolio. So thank you so much for taking the time. As Tom mentioned, number one priority of the business is to close that discount. We've, managed to get kind of four or five percent out of that over the last couple of weeks so that's been a, a positive um, and we'll continue to focus on that the, the, the options expiring that we had we had 16 new financial planning groups um, become part of that shareholder base so that was a real positive for us so we think that the kind of increased liquidity um, having a quality manager like WCM will continue to see us um, get there uh, over the next few months and Thank you for your support. Look forward to your dividend in February as well. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. I was like, you're back in the 35 degree heat outside. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Bye, guys. <laughs>